so they have to dim the light. Thank you. So, finally here we are. Welcome all of you, ITM members and international guests, to the ITM Aarhus Plenary Meeting 2023, Living on the Edge. Yes, indeed, Charlotte. <laughs> we are so happy to be here, or jeg er særlig glad at være tilbage i den vidunderlige by Aarhus. Med ITM blandt kære danske, nordiske og internationale venner og kollegaer. By the way, Alza, did you know that there's a certain story to the lighthouse in the picture that we've been using for visual identity? No. No. It's the Rubia Knude. Rubia Knude Lighthouse, I present. The story of that lighthouse is that it was actually moved all in one piece back in 2019. Um, by humans. Uh, yes. They got together and joined all their skills to move the lighthouse 70 meters inland to avoid that coastal erosion would cause, cause the lighthouse to fall into the sea. So uh, the spot from where this picture is actually taken does not longer exist, but the lighthouse does due to the fact that it's been moved. Wow. Mm -hmm. What a story. Forces of climate. Scary, yet great human united effort to find sound solutions. Something that we are going to dig into in the next days. Indeed. For four days in the company of more than 500 colleagues from 55 countries, you will all have the rare opportunity to discuss and digest the ethical and practical role of performing arts in the face of climate emergency. We've approached the meeting's topic with respect, carefully considering the context, the discussions surrounding it. We've made efforts to provide a platform for opposing perspectives um, and less mainstream worldviews. Throughout the meeting, you will also have the opportunity to meet artists uh, and colleagues uh, to discuss dilemmas from the high north, from the Arctic, a corner of the world that is rarely represented in contexts like this one. Indeed. And derived from the attentions of the IETM's very own 2020 strategy work, Rewiring the Network, this meeting's curated program aims to encourage and support locally rooted yet international conversations where we strive to understand and find the balances between the local realities and the global dynamics and that we agree that no one, no person, no country, no region of this still beautiful earth we inhabit is the holder of the truth. Yet, together we can make a lasting contribution for our sector and for our common space. And on that note, I want to say, it has been an absolute pleasure for the whole ITM team to work together with the Aarhus team in creating this meeting. Thank you, Aarhus team. Thank you. <laughs> yes. It has been a really great pleasure. The collaboration has felt like being one bigger organization at times, which is nice. Working together has been very inspiring. Performing Arts Platform in itself is a very small organization, so of course we could not have taken on the task of hosting an ITM plenary on our own. So apart from the collaboration with the ITM team in Brussels, We've had the privilege of dedicated collaborating partners 
as well as the good fortune of generous support from a wide range of funding bodies, which have allowed us to embark on this journey. And we want to thank them. And first off is the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union. The Danish Arts Foundation. The City of Aarhus. The Central Denmark Region and the European Region of Culture. The Yulan Art Foundation. The Nordic Culture uh, Fund. Culture Fund, yes. <laughs> and the Nordic Culture Point of the Nordic Council of Ministers. The Augustinus Foundation and also the Aarhus Stiftens Foundation. And last but not least, all of you IATM members who with your membership fees enable us to run an organization which, amongst other things, strives to provide you with strong, large, meaningful gatherings such as IATM Aarhus. Yes, I second that answer. Also, we want to thank the venues that you'll be visiting during this plenary. It's Bora Bora, Opnesine, Gospen, Concert Hall of Aarhus, Theatre Filuan, Theatre Reflexion, Catapult, and our collaboration partners, Copenhagen Stage, Ilt Festival, and ESAP Conference. Also, we thank our content committee and the artistic jury of the Living on the Edge Festival. Voila! And now, Celotte and I have the great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker of today to the stage, the sociologist and writer Nikolai Schultz. Schultz, who is born in Aarhus, is a PhD fellow at the Department of Sociology at the University of Copenhagen, where he is currently finishing his thesis on what he calls geo-social -so classes. Schultz was a long time, time collaborator of the renowned French philosopher Bruno Latour, with whom he, in 2022, authored the book on the emergence of the ecological class, which has since been translated into 10 languages, received high critical acclaim, and inspired green parties and movements all over the world. Most recently, Schultz wrote the book Land Sickness, which has been translated into six languages. And today, Schultz will talk about what he calls the new ecological class struggle, with a particular attention to the role of art and culture in this struggle. Yeah. So, Nikolai, a very warm welcome to you on stage. Thank you very much for your invitation here today at the IMT IETM plenary meeting. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for the nice introduction. I am absolutely delighted to be back in my home city. And I'm happy to give a talk today that I have given the awfully clumsy title The Ecological Class Struggle with Special Attention to the Crucial Importance of Art, Aesthetics and Ethics. So you see, I tried to charm you there, right? What I'm going to do today is that I'm going to speak about the short book that I wrote with Bruno Latour that rightly enough has been uh, translated into a number of different languages now that came out with the name, the title, um, On the Emergence of an Ecological Class, a memo. And the circumstances for doing so are, I do admit, still a little bit special. For uh, it is not more than half a year ago since Bruno passed away just before the book was published in English. And of course, Bruno was not only a colleague of mine, he was also a close friend. Um, so indeed, that does make it a little bit special to talk about our work in common. But at the same time, it also makes me proud to be able to stand here in front of you and speak of it in the memory not only of an incredibly smart guy, but also a warm, generous, curious and funny human being who I'm sure would have been very proud to see how our arguments, our book, has not only been spreading through academic institutions, public debate and so on, but also, and very importantly, through cultural networks like yours, networks that Bruno, if any, certainly 
knew had an essential role in what he called the composition of a common habitable world. So today what I wish to do in Bruno's memory is that I wish to introduce you to three main points from the book, three points that I believe gives a good introduction to the book in general. And for the same reason, the uh, argument or the talk here today will be divided into three parts. Number two will be a little bit more technical, where the third part will touch more on what I consider that many of you peer people here are working in, namely the field of culture, art, aesthetics, and the creation of ethics. So preceding the first point, I wish to say a few introductory words about the book. So based on a long collaboration of what they spoke about before uh, between me and Bruno on what's called geosocial classes, basically the idea that the question of class is changing shape in a time of global climate change. Then me and Bruno wrote this book over a couple of months in the spring-summer 2021 in light of the upcoming French election. What puzzled us, what we were breaking our minds down through, was this intuition that we can say ecology is everywhere and ecology is nowhere. On the one hand, ecology is everywhere. everywhere. Every day we are bombarded with news, signs, alarms of an Earth system that is reacting to how we are inhabiting uh, the Earth, basically. And at least in a European, but also other places, public sphere, the question of the climate, the question of nature, the question of ecology has already manifested itself not only as one, but as the political question. So ecology is everywhere. You cannot open a newspaper without being reminded and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, ecology is nowhere. What do I mean with that? Well, with a few exceptions, the green parties around the world, every time there is an election, are struggling to even reach over the electoral threshold in France, where we were writing the book, the Green Party didn't even reach the 5% limit that allowed them to have the, uh, the funding for the campaign back. And here, in Denmark, and China to the Green Party, and I was there at their um, <laughs> election party, were celebrating it as a civilizational victory that they had reached 3%. So where does this misalignment, this asymmetry, this gap between the catastrophe unfolding itself in front of our eyes, the attention we pay to it, and the lack of political ethics come from? That is the question we address in the book by attempting to first diagnose these political, effectual, we can call it stagnations, and by trying to indicate potential pathways towards a strong ecological movement, a solid political ecology in the hope that it will be able to compete on equal footings with the old ideologies that continue to define the political landscape even if the question of ecology has become let's say the main question of ecology or of uh, politics sorry so this is what we investigate in the book and as mentioned i wish to do today uh, what i wish to do is to give you three points from the book Three main arguments. I do not have a PowerPoint. Um, it's the same thing when you do this or a similar presentation to uh, architects. You uh, realize halfway through that, oh my god, I have to have a PowerPoint because they like images. But you just realize, no, the worst thing you can do in front of people in the arts is to give pictures to it. So I decided that you are left alone with me in my articulation. But if I had had a PowerPoint, it would have said point one. Nature <laughs> does not unite, nature divides. Again, the IPCC alarm bells have been ringing for a long time. Every year outside right now in Denmark, it's not been raining for a long time. The class climate disaster is coming nearer. Proximity, intensity, and scale. So why are we not acting? Well. Probably because nobody really knows who this we is. For way too long we start our arguing, political ecology has tripped over its own feet. It's been stumbling, so to say, by formulating and representing its own political project in terms of universally, universality, you can say. It was presented as a common project that would unite us all. We all know the story because it's been the same every time an ecologist has opened his mouth or her mouth the last 50 years, gathered under the flag of Mother Nature, it was imagined that we would 
all marched together united as soon as a disaster was known or got close enough. Ecology then was the arbiter. It was the, they said, the judge that was supposed to end social conflicts and political conflicts and finally rally us around a common political project. But ecology is not a peace treaty. It's a battle cry. We see this everywhere in Europe, beyond, of course, from the activists in Germany fighting against the expansion of a coal mine through the fight against the expansion of the industrial port here in Aarhus, where we are today, through Fridays for Future to the indigenous people fighting for their territories. territory. Sorry. The, lesson is the, <laughs> the lesson is the same. These questions of nature, they don't unite us. They divide us. But, drum roll. Ellie, your performance, right? <laughs> this is uh, enough. This is not the Achilles heel of ecology. On the contrary, we argue, this is the unfulfilled potential of political ecology and the Green parties. Why? Well, because the social history has shown us repetitively, social conflicts, conflict narratives, have a far bigger potential for generating political effects and political mobilizations than peace projects has. I'm sorry to say it, but peace and harmony make people yawn. Conflicts make people ready to fight. So the problem is not conflict as such. The problem is rather that political ecology has not managed to articulate, embrace, define and represent these conflicts and that it's not managed to connect them into a, let's say, unified narrative that can mobilize people for political action. So this is our first point. For political ecology to gain a strong ideological consistency, force, autonomy, it has to identify, accept, embrace, define and represent its political project in terms of conflict. Because it can exactly help to define a we, a them, and not least a direction of history. The question is, what narrative? Point number two on my imaginary. Um, PowerPoint. A new class struggle against production for habitability. Now, historically, one concept, one narrative, one notion, one idea has been exquisitely impressive in gathering political effects, mobilizing people politically. Class and class struggle. Class theory over the past centuries provided a more or less accurate compass that allowed people to understand the fundamental lines of conflict in society, where they were positioned in this landscape, and again, what the direction of history was. Now, the first thing to remember about class is that class is never one thing. It's not been, let's say, chiseled in stone. Its meaning has changed many times throughout history. Generation after generation of social scientists have continuously reworked the notion as societies change shape. The let's say, complexity of the social structure changed, and so did the social struggles and um, injustices. So in a way, we can understand the history of the notion of class as a history of betrayal. But at the same time, you can also understand, I would say you have to understand, the history of the concept of class as a history of loyalty. Why? Well, because the last 150 years, every time the class concept has been reworked, rejuvenated, and so on and so forth, it's always been done through an initial dialogue with Marx and his theoretical legacy. No matter if analysts were adjusting, discarding, uh, discussing broadly this concept of class, they always had to tackle Marx as part of their operations. Which is why I'm afraid we have to go back to Marx for a second. Hey! A, a communist, a communist a performance artist, that's interesting. <laughs> All right. There's probably few, if any, conceptual inventions, interventions the last uh, 150 years that has been as powerful in political culture and sociology, in political debate, of course, as the ideas of class and class struggles. And the question is, of course, how it grew so powerful. One way to explain this, my way to explain this, and I'm right, as always, is that Marx provided a somehow precise map, a compass that allowed people to understand how society subsisted, 
where in this process people were positioned, what conflicts they engaged into, and which direction, again, history took. In continuance here, what is very important to remember about Marx, is that the concept of class, his class theory, was always connected to an ideal of social transformation. His class analysis was always both descriptive and normative. It had to both describe, first, a given social structure, classify people in it, and after then, uh, offer people perspectives for political action. I would say that this is why, uh, or this is the reason behind the enormous historical importance of Mar Marxism and Marxism afterwards, class narrative. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution and its enormous transformations of the material structure of society, it offered a map that allowed people to find out what made the subsistence of society possible. How were people surviving, basically, collectively? Where in this social structure were people located? Who the people were fighting against? And what the direction of action looked like? More concretely, as you will all recall, the person who was shouting up there will definitely recall, Marx gave us an understanding of how the historical social struggles were organized around the means of production, right? against the backdrop of a description of how production permitted the continuation of society, different classes were clashing together in the struggles of either keeping or taking over the means of production. So again, and I know that I'm repeating, but it's important, Marx's socialism was fully focused on the forces and relations of production. Societies continued to subsist by the grace of production. People lived by the fruits of production. They were different, positioned in a system of production where they clashed together in conflicts over the means of production that would drive these conflicts. These conflicts would drive history forward and even eventually lead to a revolutionary change of ownership over these means of production. As we know, as she knows or he knows or... Yeah, she, okay, very good. A conflict between the capitalists who owned the means of production and the proletariat class. But, drum roll. By only thinking in terms of production, one can today not answer the question of how societies continue to subsist, how class interests change shape, or how the conflicts are unfolding in what Bruno would have called our new climatic regime, a period in time, an epoch, an era in time, marked by uh, ecological degradation, climate change, and so on and so forth, we now see, like at the time of the Industrial Revolution, that the social and material infrastructure, and especially the material infrastructure, of society is rapidly transformed, which makes necessary a new description of how societies reproduce, where people are in this process, and how they clash together in conflict. Because history is a strange thing that dances oddly, and it has certainly taken a turn today that not a lot of people would have expected. The ecological sciences expected it 50 years ago. They've been warning us about it, but we have not made it into political action. And what is this insight? Well, the insight is that the continuation, the subsistence, the reproduction of society is today no longer simply secured by production, but by a long list of other earthly entities and processes that allows societies to be habitable. And what is even more peculiar is that production is exactly what has proven to destabilize the planet's conditions of habitability, and thus the subsistence of societies. The decisive difference here is that societies can no longer be understood as surviving because of production. You can even say they are surviving despite production. Today, the system of production, no matter where you open your newspaper, have turned into a system of destruction. Day after day, threatening societies and their earthly conditions of habitability. In other words, like with Marx, we are seeing that all that is solid is melting into air. We're finding out, to use another Marxist metaphor, that society has another material basis. 
so to say, that allows the continuation of, of human survival. And based on this material transformation, the class struggle changes shape just as well as new lines of ecological conflicts are becoming visible. Because what we in continuance of this material transformation see, that's what we argue in the book, is the emerging contours and the necessity of creating, developing analytically and normatively, the understanding of a new sort of class interest and a new sort of class conflict. It comes with an essential difference. This is not just a class struggle to take over the means of production, or for that matter, as we know here in Scandinavian um, cultures or um, con uh, contexts, to find a more just distribution of the fruits of production. Instead, what we mean to see the first possible sketches of is an ecological class consisting of those who are fighting against the very practices of production, against the system of production and its horizons, and whose collective interests who are gathered around, you can say, the need of securing on a local or planetary level the habitability conditions. So, while the old class struggle of the 19th, 20th century was organized around the production forces, then the new ecological class struggle is today organized around the protection, the securing, the maintenance of the planet's conditions of habitability. A struggle between those who wish to limit these practices and those who wish to expand them, despite the destructive consequences that we see everywhere is happening. And this is exactly where we argue that the potential for a collective political ecological narrative lies, the possibility of a we and the possibility of defining the history, or the, the, the direction of history lies. In the ruins of production, we see the first contours as well as the possibility and the necessity of strengthening a strong, well-defined we, a new ecological class. All right. Point three, a little bit technical. Breathe for a second. Mm. At least I had to. Let me just sum up. Green parties, political ecologists, green movements must, ac must accept that ecology is not a peace treaty. It's a battle cry, it's a war declaration. It must create a strong we and a strong them, as well as an understanding of what this we is fighting for. In the same way as Marx defined a people that corresponded to the social question of the 19th and the 20th century. Today we need to define a people that matches the ecological question. And again, one possible solution to this, or one indication that we uh, suggest, is the idea of an ecological class rallied around the protection of the earthly conditions of subsistence, the habitability conditions, and against production. Not taking over the means of production, but fighting the very horizon of production. But, um, as we know through social history, it is simply not enough to identify and position oneself along such objective lines of conflict. This is why point number three is called the indispensable cultural struggle for ideas. So what is that? Well, it is not enough to position yourself along objective lines of conflict. On the contrary, the Green parties would do well to remember that so-called objective class interests have never been sufficient to engage people in struggles, and they have certainly not been enough to create a strong class consciousness. Instead, what you need is a whole universe, a whole cultural spectrum of ideas, notions, narrative, visions, aesthetics, if you wish to bring people together, if you wish to construct political effects, and if you wish to mobilize people for political action. This is, of course, what the Italian um, philosopher Gramsci called the quest for hegemony or the struggle for hegemony, understood as the essential insight that long before any ideology, any political party, any social class can cash in or hope to win political power, it has to engage seriously in the cultural struggle of ideas. It might seem superfluous, facts, justice, morality might be on your side. One might even feel that you don't have time 
to fight this cultural struggle, but you cannot skip it. Why? Because the cultural battlefield is as important, has always been as important, continues to be as important as the political battlefield. Another way to put this argument is that no matter how well oiled the cart may be, it's better to put it after the horse, even if the horse drags its hoofs as it plods along heavily. No matter how you phrase it, no matter how you frame it, it strikes me, it strikes us, Bruno, that the ecologists have failed immensely on this point. Imagine you turn on the TV, yet again, despair is being transmitted. Jill Scott Heron might have been right that the revolution would not be televised. But seemingly, the end of the world is on prime time, right? Like a long introduction, wildfires in California, Canada, the sky in New York is red, heat waves in France, floods in Pakistan. Four people appear in a TV debate to discuss this horrific situation. A liberalist, a socialist, a conservatist, and an ecologist. Now, what might become clear to the spectator is that the very first three of these offer no realistic horizon, political horizon, in the face of climate change. Their ideologies are simply, basically, and their mode of argumentation as well, are not rooted or on par, you would say, with the situation that we find ourselves in. They cannot connect the new question of a people, politics, and a planet. But what they do offer is a whole, again, register a catalogue of notions, images, narratives that touches every political soul. The liberalist might speak of individual freedom, personal responsibility, the socialist might speak of solidarity, equality, and the conservative might speak about the nation or the people. Notions that add a little bit of ideological flavour to their political project and perhaps even aestheticise them due to the historical cultural connotations that these notions carry. With our poor friend, the ecologist, on the other hand, things are typically different. This person has clearly understood that we are facing unheard or heard of danger, that we are inhabiting a different world, and that we need a different politics. But how often have any of us, any of you, ever heard an ecologist offer any notions, narratives that infuses ecologism with any desirable content. Rarely, no matter what you said down there, I didn't hear it. Would have been awful if you said a lot. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm just going to leave them. Rarely, because when they appear on TV, they typically seem panicky about the state of event, moralistic about people's lack of actions, resulting in an awfully boring cocktail of have to and should do tasteless enough to make even the most sympathetic soul yawn. This appears to me to be another reason for the lack of ethics associated with political ecology today. Why? Because necessity is dull and because panic is tiresome. And because voting has to do with having a choice that is choosing something. And I have asked the question elsewhere, who would ever choose to vote for a party that you have to vote for, for the planet not to die, or that you should vote for, for moral reasons? Almost nobody, and understandably so. So, to sum up, another reason that political ecology has not managed to win the political struggle is because they have largely neglected this cultural struggle. Instead, they thought they could rest on cold facts about the incoming disaster, soak them in moralism, but as we all know, then the prudent sees danger and hides himself. Much rather than basing their argumentation on Friedrich Hölderlin's old quip that where the danger is also grows the saving power, then they ought to, or they should have, followed an artist's advice, Jenny Holzer's, that lack of charisma can be fatal. Because that certainly also counts in the sphere of politics. Again, as indicated, 
The concrete antidote to the deficit of effect would be to take seriously the necessity of constructing from scratch a whole cultural archive of ecological ideas, images, aesthetics, visions, pictures that imbue political ecology with positive and desirable connotations. Only with such a register at hand can ecology create enthusiasm and only with such can people begin mirroring themselves in ecology. Only then can political ecology create a strong we, only then can ecology begin to compete on equal terms with the old ideologies. And what I hope is clear here by now is of course that a crucial alliance for ecologists are the artistic domains. Poets, filmmakers, writers, musicians, sculptors, painters, performers, all their work, all your work is necessary if we are to build ethics affiliations and attitudes that creates or corresponds to the situation we find ourselves in. Imagine what a painter like Frida Kahlo did for communism, what a writer like Jack Turek did for liberalism, what a filmmaker like Jean-Luc Godard did for socialism. Imagine what you people could do for ecology. To echo Ursula Le Guin, we need both the curiosity of science and the risk of aesthetics, and for good reasons, as you know, because since etymologically, aesthetics means to render something sensible. And a crisis of sensibility is definitely what we're finding ourselves in. So, to sum up today's lecture, three points from the book that the Green Parties, the ecologists, should take note of if political ecology wants to be taken seriously. One, it must accept that these issues give rise to conflicts. Second, from this it must create a strong we. Thirdly, the struggle must necessarily also be cultural. And what I hope that the third point clarifies is that perhaps more than any other people, the artistic domains does have a responsibility to create a response ability, as Donna Haraway puts it. Exactly because the work of artists have always dealt with making people feel, sense what they don't feel already or that what they didn't feel before. So, my final battle cry called out here today to mark the opening of IETM's 2023 plenary meeting for the Green Party and the climate activists to join forces with those artistic domains that knows how to touch people. And for this, for you, your artistic army, your captains and colonels, to come to the aid of ecologists and their desperate efforts by offering what you have always offered, a redistribution of ethics and sensibilities. Safeguarding the planet's conditions of habitability might depend on it. Thank you very much. Nicola, what an empowering provocation and a call to us. Thanks a lot. Let's sit down. Let's sit down. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> so, dear ITM members and guests, now it's your chance to... Uh, I feel like a lamp in a wolf. Uh. It's a bit... Uh, the lights are a bit high up here. I think now we can our dear light. lighting designer is changing that for us. Yeah, that's much better. I think, I am sure that this call out to you is inspiring you and making you have a lot of questions for Niccolo. So I'm just going to, you know, please go ahead. There's one over there. Fantastic. <laughs> the mics are coming. Thank you very much for a um, thought provoking talk. Um, I wonder if one might also say that there are a lot of affects, you know, the rise of all these names these days, climate anxiety, ecological grief, so on and so on. Um, so it's not that these existing narratives about what is happening in the climate catastrophe are boring, 
but perhaps they are provoking feelings that are hard to be with, to process. And I think that arts could also have a role there. Um, but I was also wondering about this notion of conflict and then how you spoke about that from the conflict one to move one could move to a we and i wonder if this we is possible thinking about inequalities that are linked to how you know different people and places are affected differently so i was hoping you could maybe elaborate a little bit on this possibility of a we well I'll start with the last part of it of course the that's the argument always, but we can't encourage as a society because people in India want to have a refrigerator and so on and so forth, or the poor people in society are not the people who want to fight this middle class struggle and so on. But historically, I mean, the first people who's been crushed under production has been the workers. They are the first people, the lower class, let's say classical, uh, in an economical sense, are the first people to feel, we know that statistically, the bad air, the bad water, and of course also the rising seas if you're living in a given city that is facing stuff like that. Um, but of course you're completely right that you have to create a language that can make these people mirror themselves in this, right? And I do strongly believe, and that leads me to your second question, that that is a question of ethics. Now, you're right about the fact that there are ethics, but those are sad, sad passions passions that we have not, ethics that we have not, attitudes that we have not mobilized into a political thing. Of course we are all feeling what I would call land sickness in a certain way. We're all feeling a, a sort of human, let's say, transformation, knowing that you are on a football we call planet Earth that is being moved and being destroyed because of your own actions. But how do we make those ethics, those inertias, those climate anxieties or so on and so forth, something that make political impact. And here I strongly believe that we have to create attractive, desirable, inspiring, and I would, I would even say narratives that can make people create a we. But you are, you're very right about them. I, I would say that today we're living in a very strange time where we are completely feeling it and completely not feeling it. The psychoanalysis would say that the non-feeling is a feeling as well. Think about it. The <laughs> and now I'm not only speaking politically or sociologically, but existentially, the way that we open the newspaper and see the dire conditions of the situation compared to how we go on with business as usual is nauseating. It's scary. I mean, somebody like Sartre, who could not have imagined anything of about climate change, would say that we're all living in uh, mauvais foi, bad faith. We're not facing it. So there are ethics, but the ethics is an unfacing. And I think strongly that we have to describe both those ethics, but also create desirable, effectual, let's say, content, so to say, to make not only ourselves shut up or look the other way, but to actually face where we are, who we are, and how we can create politically a reaction to that. Thank you. We have a question over there. Thank you, Nikolai, for this raw um, awakening of the aesthetics. Um, I have recently been reading the, your newest book, uh, Land Sickness, and there's two points in it that I would really love you to elaborate on. One is the intergenerational thing. You have this beautiful story about your grandmother feeling the responsibility of what is happening on Earth. And the other one is this really hard discussion of freedom mm. uh, and even emancipation. Um, and how we deal with this need for our freedom to go around. Absolutely awful. People never ask one question. <laughs> ask two questions so you can get completely this loud. No, to start with the first one, what was the first one? Freedom or generations? Well, I would say that of course this is a, this, uh, a fundamental division, conflict in this whole situation, both politically but also existentially, as you indicate, is the struggle between generations. Well, first of all, I mean, remember, g generations comes from genesis, and this is certainly a question of the genesis of the habitability conditions of the Earth. And of course, because a very legit way, I would say, of describing the climate situation that we're facing today is through the colonization of time. 
this situation that we are experiencing is not only a colonization of space, long story short, we, the Westerners, have been living off other people's territories, and right now, let's say the destructive consequences of that is falling down <laughs> in their heads first. But it's also a colonization of time, well, in the sense that certain generations have been living off other people's times. My grandmother, she lived in the future, but off the present, which is today becoming visible for everybody, because people are seeing that not only my or my kids' generation, but future generations more generally, will see their earthly conditions of subsistence seriously threatened because of what happened before. So the ecological class will not only fight to superimpose the little, let's say, territory you live on and the territory you live on, it will also fight somehow to superimpose the times you live in and the times you live off. It would be, as I say, everybody have the, have the, the right to live in their own space, on their own territory, and in their own times not being colonized. So to go back to my grandmother and that part of the book that you're referring to, she understood exactly that she had been colonizing my, my time, me and my little brother's times. Why? Well, a part of the, as a part of the post-war generation, she had, after the war, been fighting, long story short, for prosperity, for a strong economy, for welfare, for freedom, right? For growth. This was her political, collective, but also <laughs> subjective autobiography. A heritage that she was so strongly proud of having built and that she was completely sure that her children, my father and my generation, would take over with pride, embrace with happiness and confidence. But again, as I said, history is a very weird thing that sometimes dances oddly and violently. Because what my grandmother, then at the very end of her life, is now finding out is not only that we have to go in another direction. No, she's finding out something a lot more violent, which is that the things that she was fighting for did not bring her kids prosperity, not only at least. It is exactly what had strapped them on a planet that is now violently reacting to that dream. That's an incredible existential... Uh, uh, how can you sleep at night knowing that everything you fought for has now trapped your grandchildren in a situation? But the argument is, of course, that then we have to uh, go on the roof of Musikus and push our elders out of the, on the on floor. No, no, but we have to articulate these, these divisions exactly in order to create political alliances. I think that's what generally also connects my work, both the sociological aspect and the existential aspect. I'm very interested in how we are divided. Not necessarily to remain divided, but because I think we are fighting both individually and collectively false, we are finding ourselves in a false peace if we, if we accept that this is not division. But we are divided inside ourselves, between our elders, between classes in politics and so on and so forth. And I think we need a language to articulate that. So now you're questioning whether I'll answer you on freedom. There's a lot of hands now. We have one up here, and there's two over there. It's on. It's on? Oh, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned Marx uh, a fair bit, and, um, and the kind of human struggle for representation within a political system. And I wonder how much the ecological crisis tests that or advance that. Uh, I think a, a, a theme that constantly comes up is, well, do non-human others have any kind of rights within our political system? And would that be a way to fight ecological collapse if they did? Or is that an absurd idea for you? And actually climate change m means a kind of, uh, a much kind of bigger change to our political system and democracy and representation within that, if that makes sense. Ah, oh, there you are. Yeah. Well, I kind of, they're sitting at, there's a tree over there. So right now, I, you see, there's a plant. Right now, I have to say that the non-humans should have rights. No, it's, it's, I think it's one of the things we have to discuss now when we are rebuilding, recomposing what politics means. 
The most important thing is just that we find a way of, let's say, emerging or letting the ecological uh, earthly subsistence questions be emerged into politics. And it's not very difficult, actually, because it's always been there, even if we always pushed it a little bit aside. Again, that's why I like to go back to Marx, because Marx started by human survival. How do societies reproduce, right? That's his fundamental question. Where in this process are people, and what are the struggles that goes on? But I'm saying that's a complete same situation we're finding out today, that we are rediscovering how societies reproduce not only through production, but through negotiation with a lot of other entities of, of, of earthly subsistence, with an earth system, basically. Some of them are plants, some of them are ocean streams, some of them is about air, soil, and so on and so forth. We have to put them in there somehow. And I think if we go through the modern history, it's, it's actually, it's ex instead of saying this is a completely new thing, I would rather say that this is a tweak, even if it's a pretty tough tweak, so to say. Whether that means that we have to give rights to, to non-humans and so on and so forth, I don't know, I haven't made up my mind, but I think it's a very important question, probably, I would say. So we have one more question, and we are pressed for time, so it will be this question and then maybe one more, and that'll be it, yes. <laughs> so, uh, feeling the pressure for asking a very good question, but um, I'm, I'm curious about the role of art and also in times of war and conflict, because I also feel that I'm trained to step out of the conflict to make sure that the conflict it, is not happening. And the policies that are made, we are still in the shadow of the Second World War, where we don't want the culture to be a, um, a voice that can operate as a, as a revolution, but still it's needed. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. I'm not sure I understood the question, to be honest, which is awful because you said you had pressure on you to ask. Right? Yeah, so that was really I'm, bad. I'm, I'm sure no, but I'm just like, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, it's, the, it's the whole notion of us, the ones who should now, you say, we, we are the ones who could save the situation by backing up certain course, political voices. But I, I'm just curious in terms of what you think about that, if the consequence of that is war or the consequence of that is, uh, yes, we have to push uh, our older generation out f over that clip, uh, cliff. You know, uh, there are consequences. It's about privilege. So I just want to hear more about that. Yeah, OK. Um, well, I think you need art to, I'm not, I'm not an artist. I know absolutely nothing about art, which is very free, whatever I say, then, right? But I'm just saying that we need, as has been indicated through the other questions, to somehow aestheticize this, to somehow effectualize it. How do you do that without turning it into war? I would say, why? Why, do, why would you not turn it into a war? It is a war. That's the whole point. That you are already seeing your territories being attacked by big production machines and so on and so forth, by capitalism, by people who are taking away your conditions of habitability. I know people are very afraid about this word of war, but at least then you listen. And it is already a declared war. It's, it's, it's a false peace situation we're sitting in. If you, if you open up your newspaper, what do you see? You're seeing the rich people <laughs> buying bunkers in New Zealand and flying to Mars. War has already been declared. It's about defining this war, positioning yourself in it. And I think for that, to create after that objective analysis has been done and so on and so forth, then I think you need art to make people affected by it. What does that mean in terms of making art? Does it mean being creating new, being a plant, being sensitive to things that you were not sensitive to before? Does it mean making sensitivity for conflict and so on and so forth? In a second, we're going to see a performance out here called We Are The One Percent. So all of these things, I'm not, the, I'm not the person to ask how to do art, but I know that you are in a war. And I know you need art to make that shake in people, because or else they're going to walk around thinking that there is no war. Mm. So there's one question in here as well. So thank you for finally saying capitalism in this whole lecture. Uh, I, I think we should, I mean, if we're talking 
directly and openly. This is the Mark Span. Um, I think what you're saying without saying it, which is really strange to me, <laughs> is the fact that we are in a war against capitalism. Among other things, yeah. Because, I mean, if, if there were a functional socialism today, it wouldn't have been an extracting, colonizing p politics. So I'm just like, for me, all of these things that you've said are also <laughs> kind of strange because you're counting on artists and you're in a way, um, you've invited us to create basically a PR um, campaign. Exactly. For ecologists. That's what I'm here to do. Which also, no. Yes, it is. I mean, we're I'm, You're not here to accept for it, sure maybe, no but I'm here to do it. Yes, That's and thank way. you for that. It was a lovely, lovely lecture. But what I'm saying is, artists are workers. I mean, we are talking about uh, using our means of production and taking them. Like, there, there was a two month period where there were no planes flying over the world. Like, we can go on a general strike. I mean, that because that's basically what we're saying. We're saying, let's stop working because we are also workers. We shouldn't be the ones that anyone counts on to lead the revolution. No revolution was ever led by an artist. It was always led by the workers. It was fueled by it. I mean, and many other things, you would agree. But I think that what we need to do is kind of not be the um, spokespeople for um, climate activists or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I think what we would do, should do is just demonstrate this urgency that we all feel, this enormous apathy and depression in the wake of something that's gonna basically destroy the world. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel that we're still talking about a socialism, mm -hmm. not a democratic socialism. So a demo not a democratic socialism, but a socialism that has to be revolutionary. I think yeah. you're saying two different things. So you're questioning about the question of art, which is completely fair, but I agree very much on your last point, that it is up to you to simply demonstrate this urgency. That's the only thing I'm saying. I'm not saying that you should strike. That would be completely uh, silly. Why would you do that? I mean, <laughs> the question of, 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 of capitalism, of course, is at the very heart of this, but I'm just saying that it's even deeper, that it's not only capitalism, it's production itself. Again, if you read through the history of, of, of socialism, socialism was a productivist horizon of society. That's the only one thing that both the socialists, the communists, and the liberalists were agreeing on, that the horizon of society was production. Then we can speak about reinventing socialism. Yeah, we can call it that if you prefer, but I'm just saying it cannot just be a revolutionary change over the means for production. I'm seeing socialism as a, of course I'm a socialist, completely, but it has to, redefine itself as being against production. My other, I'm not saying there's a problem with the word capitalism, but the fact is just that we've been saying there's overthrow capitalism for 150 years, right? How did that go? Capitalism for me is, is, is a notion, or let's say the revolutionary Marxist critique is, 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 is uh, I don't think first of all, this is what I just said before, that it completely captures the situation. And secondly, I'm afraid that it doesn't affect people. I'm afraid that that notion we have become unsensible uh, to. Maybe you with your art, if you don't strike, can make people sensitive to it again. That would be a first step. Mm. Thank, so, you. Thank, Thank you, you Nikolai. given us a lot to discuss and digest in the coming days. Thanks so much. <clears throat>
We encourage you to read the courtesy tips, our transparency note, and our tips on environmental consciousness at the meeting, which we have put together and can all be found under practical information on the meeting page on the ITM website. We have all been learning important codes of contact in the last years, and some of us are still learning. I quoted the Safe Space Guidelines of Urban APA in Belgrade, and I will quote two of them again. Let's respect the physical, mental, and emotional boundaries of others as well as our own. Let's strive to act with positive intent and take care of each other. And again, my new favorite, no one is the holder of the truth. Yes, Elsa. I like that one too. Uh, I would also add, always try to assume that people have the right intentions when they speak. Even if you disagree, be curious about the proposition of others. So, and now we should get ready for a welcome reception at the beautiful Aarhus City Hall. Yeah, sorry. At the beautiful City Hall, right across the park. And since we're all going there, I love that building. So since we're all going there, I thought I would give a few insights on the building. The City Hall is more than 80 years old, but it still presents itself as a quite modern building. The City Hall is designed by the renowned Danish architects Arne Jakobsen and Erik Müller. The exterior surface of the building is actually clad with Norwegian marble. Uh, okay, okay. So. for sharing. Thank you. We have a new member of the ITM. Now, what I was trying to say was that please take a good look at the building when we go there. Don't worry, if you are in doubt on how to get there, I'm sure there'll be plenty of possibilities for guidance. So, without further ado, let's all walk together. Yes, thank you. Very well, welcome, and let's enjoy the next days. <laughs>